Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak here today. I would like to thank the organizers of uh, the festival, but also would like to thank the, the Getty Foundation for um, providing funding for this research to make this um, research for the exhibition possible. So I'm going to um, highlight some of the um, themes that will be um, discussed, uh, presented in the exhibition in 2024. And um, I would like to start with tribute to Newton Harrison, who passed away on September 4th of this year, just a few weeks shy of his 90th birthday. The family and art community is continuing to grieve the loss of this ecological art pioneer. His intention and guiding presence for listening to the web of life will terribly missed. Helen Mayer and Newton Harrison, simply known as the Harrisons, became legends in their own time. Many artists will continue to be inspired by them. As the ecological artist and um, activist Lillian Ball affirms, they were the forces of nature whose ongoing influence will be felt throughout generations. Their collaboration that lasted nearly 50 years ultimately led to the first husband and wife shared professorship at UC San Diego. After Helen passed away in 2018, Newton continued their urgent ecological legacy at the Center for the Force Majeure initiative they were co-founded at UC Santa Cruz, working until the last days of his life on his final new um, work called a sensorium for the world ocean. As part of the Gitis uh, Pacific Standard Time, Art and Science 2024, La Historical Society in San Diego, in collaboration with uh, three other exhibition venues, will present Helen and Newton Harrison uh, California work, a groundbreaking four-part exhibition offering a critical reappraisal of their California-based works. The exhibitions will highlight their extraordinary art and science collaboration that ignited many generations of ecological um, art and environmental art uh, practitioners. Ecological art is a distinctive subcategory of environmental art that focuses on the biological interdependencies in ecosystems. To understand ecosystems and to work with them as an artistic medium and to create successful ecological and environmental interventions, the Harrisons have had must to master environmental science, as Edward Schenken's words. Um, in the beginning, at first, Newton was a sculptor and a painter, and Helen was a um, researcher and educator. Graduating from Yale in 1965 with both bachelor's and master's degrees in fine art, Newton secured his first faculty position as an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. And then in two years, he moved to La Jolla in 1967 to become one of the two founding members of the visual arts department at UC San Diego. Helen, who was known for her activism and research-based work in literature, chose to dedicate herself to the Harrison collaboration when they made a map of endangered species around the world for an exhibition uh, called Fur and Feathers at the Museum of Crafts in New York City in 1969. Then the Harrisons collectively made the decision um, not to work, uh, not to do any works that didn't benefit the ecosystems. The Harrison's work began with urban farming and soil reclamation. In 1969, Newton became involved with making of earth as a kind of private performance by gathering sand, clay, sewage sludge, cow, chicken, and horse manure and leaf material, throwing some worms watering every few days, and then churning it repeatedly using a hand shovel, he discovered a metaphor for creating earth, as opposed to an overreaching steam shovel tool for destroying earth, in Newton's words. 
At the same time, Helen began to invest herself in the earth that Newton had made and began growing things in it. So strawberries grew delicious and sweet, resulting in a work making strawberry jam for the exhibition in a bottle at California State University, Fullerton. Making earth was, according to the artists, a metaphor for the idea of regenerating the earth worldwide. Making earth responded to the worldwide endangerment of top topsoil, which be has become a disastrous environmental problem throughout the world, far worse today than it was then. Influenced by John Cage, Cage's aesthetics of chance operations, the Harrisons continued to make gross pieces, uh, constructing hog, hog pastures, fish farms, portable orchards, flat pastures in such spaces as the Hayward Gallery in London, the new, the new National Gallery in Berlin, the Houston Museum of Contemporary Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and various university galleries in the early 1970s. Annual hot pasture mix, portable orchard, portable farm operated not only metaphorically, but concretely. In addition to referencing earth and nature symbolically, they created actual ecosystems encompassing their biological processes that generate and regenerate in order to create themselves. Known for their aesthetics of beautifully designed red wooden containers, these early ecocritical works also entered into debate with highly acclaimed formalist work of their contemporaries, Dan Flavin, Donald Judd, by arguing to put the utilitarian aspect of artwork back into the form. The Harrison survival pieces began involving ecosystem as a whole of complex systems that are based on the fundamental interdependency of all phenomena of nature. In La Jolla Promenade, or Surviving Peace 4 in 1971, the artist understood that simple cause and effect scenarios didn't work. The snails and dog piece was about how an under-examined theory can go wrong if you stay on the surface in the artist's words. The theory was very simple. Snails, an invasive species brought to the US by a previous in the 17th century can be controlled by ducks eating them. So when ducks and snails were placed at the garden at the La Jolla Contemporary Art Museum, ducks ate all the snails and they began to eat the garden, making a terrible mess. <laughs> La Jolla Promenade was an interesting artist's mistake, revealing a misunderstanding how ecosystems work. From 1974, with the San Diego as a center of the world, the Harrison's work began to engage the prospect of climate change, and from there, they looked at the rising sea levels and the possible massive environmental changes that could dismantle many of the ecosystems on the planet. Conceived in five parts, the work visualized the implications of the argument of Robert Bryce and Gilbert Pass by proposing short and long-term scenarios of melting and freezing. Print 4 projected a global warming scenario based on Pass's argument that the burning of coal and oil would cause global warming, thus higher CO2 levels and an accelerated greenhouse effect and melting glaciers and a rise in temperatures and sea levels with a mean air temperature of 22 degrees and an ocean level rise of at least 20, 30 feet, with many coastal areas become uninhabitable. An accompanying text below the map set in Newton words essentially, quote, although we don't know the answers, we have the cap capabilities of simultaneously planning for opposite conditions, so let's do that. The Harrison's California work of the 1970s was toward the fourth into the whole system thinking that later would inform their work on the reclamation of watersheds and environmental rehabilitations of cities and the surrounding environs. The Lagoon Cycle 
<clears throat> perhaps their best known California work, a complex 360 degree photo mural in 60 parts was exhibited at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Herbert Johnson Museum at Cornell University and was later acquired by the Center Georges Pompidou in Paris. Conceived as a dialogue between the lagoon maker and the witness, the lagoon cycle visualizes a story involving a hero, a Sri Lankan crab, named Skila Serata, transported to San Diego, the west coast of the United States. The story unfolds as, in Newton words, a monumental mural, a picturesque novel, and a storyboard for a movie. At the heart of the lagoon cycle are several key themes, the considerations of the lagoons and watersheds as complex self-sustaining polyculture ecosystems, the relationship of ecology and culture, the future of ecological and ecocultural well-being, the delusions of experimental science, and the unintended harmful outcomes of megatechnology on nature. The Harrisons chose uh, the estuarial lagoon, a special place with a rich variety of life, yet also fragile, as a metaphor for nature and culture. In the third lagoon, the lagoon maker says, an estuarial is a place where fresh and salt water meet and mix. It is a fragile meeting and mixing, not having the consistency of the ocean or the rivers. It is a collaborative adventure. Its existence is at always at risk. But life in the lagoon is very special. It has evolved high tolerance to the stresses that come from about, from sudden changes, in fresh and salt water and temperature and available feed for the life web, life in the lagoon is tough and very rich. Developed as an artistic visualization of the original experimental scientific work studying how living organisms react to a specific environment, the Harrisons developed a firm argument against the industrial exploitation of the environment leading to the depletion of ecosystems. This work also raised a quintessential question about the cost of belief. How much does it cost to believe in something? The artists ask. If I believe in endless, then the cost of that belief is the death of our ecosystems. The lagoon maker and witness lament in one voice the deadly and catastrophic long-term outcomes of megatechnological solutions. For instance, if the flow of waters in the Colorado River system has been interrupted by dam after dam, which demands of the river that is generates electricity and serve as a source of, of portable water for the cities outside of the watershed, while requiring, requiring the river to act as a sewer for agricultural wastes, then the state of the river has been changed. And that change must reverberate back through the system. Pay attention to the cost of belief. The lagoon cycle ends with a prophecy of the future existence. Earth has warmed, all ice has melted, the oceans have risen. Uh, and ecosystem and civilizations alike are under stress. The lagoon maker and witness speak in one voice. When your lands are covered with water, and together we will draw as the water rise. The lagoon cycle discusses the consequences of vast technologically enabled exploitations of natural resources that would effectively lead to a widespread ecocide finished in 1984 through a leap of imagination and intuition, the lagoon cycle prophetically concludes that climate change and global warming are inevitable and goes on to imagine um, future ecologies. During the 1980s and 90s, the Harrisons developed a range of innovating projects that combined installation-based presentations in galleries, museums, and public spaces with field work and research that sought to inform and influence government policies and planning processes globally. Arroyo Seco release, a serpentine for Pasadena, Devil's Gate, a refugia for Pasadena, and California Wash, 
all proposed ecological restoration and uh, reinvention of specific watersheds and finite environmental systems in Los Angeles. The Harrison's methods involved the organization of factual materials, such as archival maps and photographs of environmental despoliations, and to a cohesive narrative. The Serpentine Lattice, 1993, asked for a change in the government policy to address deforestation of the folk forest and related environmental degradation. Their work combined an astute engagement with complex currents of environmental and ecological science with a finely tuned sensibility to the transformative potential of Quatodian human interaction in the process of dialogical exchange through what they termed conversational drift. The Harrison's prophetic vision of rising sea levels uh, in the lagoon cycle was further expanded and advanced over the years in the force majeure series of works. The Harrisons recognized that on the deep time scale of evolution, humans were a relatively recent phenomenon and that our species reign on Earth inevitably had an expiration date, just like all other species that had come and gone before us. Therefore, the new strategies of adaptation and survival we needed. The base of San Francisco became an 162,000 um, hectare estuary lagoon, Sajan, a proving ground, and ongoing, and the high Sierras near Tahoe, and the future garden for the central coast of California from 2018 ongoing at the Arboretum at UC Santa Cruz, speak to the Harrison's hope of saving the planet in the face of the crisis posed by climate change and its threat to the Earth's many ecosystems. Drawings, uh, photo text panels, photographs, and conceptual design proposals address adaptive responses to the pressure on planetary systems negatively impacted by industrial processes as global warming accelerates. When they set up the Center for the Study of Force Majeure in 2009 at UC Santa Cruz, the Harrisons adopted the legal term force majeure, which refers to the circumstances that are beyond the control of the parties involved to describe the state of the planet. As co-directors of the center, they collaborated with many experts to foresee and mitigate rising waters, storm surges, shrinking coastlines, fires engulfing immense land masses that set off corresponding human disasters. The Harrison showed their concerted effort must be invested in the design of future ecologies that would be able to function in new temperature regimes and environmental conditions. The force majeure series introduced a new form of cross-disciplinary activity that would anticipate major planetary events, demand corresponding adaptation. In collaboration with scientists, the artists assumed a new kind of agency as uh, tira reterraformers, planetary gardeners responsible for the mitigation of species, creation of succession ecosystems, and reorganization of human settlements. The Harrisons called audiences to question the limits of artistic agency, inviting viewers to contemplate the greater responsibilities of an artwork as a work of a cross-disciplinary science, as a work of preemptive by regional planning, and as a reterraforming work that is more than simply an unrealizable metaphor in the face of ecological extinction. The Harrison's work stretched not only the methodology, but also the content of both art and science, assuming an entirely new ethical dimension while contributing to an active production of knowledge. The Harrison's force majeure series not only warned about the horrific implications because news is not good and only getting worse, but also invited transformative thinking about human adaptation at great scale. Newton said that works of art were transformative in nature. The Harrison's insisted that art can change the world for better, not just by enriching the life and spirit of those who love it, but proposing new solutions to problems revealed by the 
artistic way of seeing combined with science, engineering, and social critique. The ideas of art and artistic practice overlap with that of British social anthropologist Alfred Jell held, namely, that visual art objects are not a part of language, nor do they constitute an alternative language, but thus should not be treated simply as illustrations of visual texts. Instead, Jell argued that they are tangible indices of social interactions. They act as social agents of change. Um, so in this work, uh, in our exhibition that will be presented 2024, so we hope to demonstrate through uh, more than uh, 150 works on, on display that are planned, um, diverse artistic approaches, and uh, in Harrison's work, they are uh, affinities with um, different sciences, uh, also they are uh, myriad of relationships with um, peers, friends, rivals, expert collaborators, political figures, and intellectual heroes. And more importantly, we hope that this exhibition will help to generate many fruitful conversations within the community and invite the audiences to contemplate how they can contribute to preemptive work of art and work um, of adaptive regional planning in the context of climate change. Thank you so much. <laughs>